will be over for us anyway, amen? Life eternal. We don't have to live with them around it. That's what the Bible says, uh, because of iniquity, for iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Yeah. What's there? There. Just remember, though, the head of, your, of the party, of the Republican Party still, who is fighting to be number one, wants three exceptions for, for uh, abortion. Trump, that's what he said. So, they don't believe in the abolition of abortion. But they would not, they neither repented they of their murders, nor their fornications, nor their sorcery, right? They're, they're not going to stop. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13 and 14 here, as we look at it tonight. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Father in heaven, Lord, we pray you be with us now and help us and guide our steps. Direct us, Lord, in the words of God here tonight. Thank you so much for them. Please fill our hearts with the truth and uh, help us to live it every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I, I think we'll, we'll do a little bit of a, Albert Barnes gives a, a little bit of a, uh, I'm going to read a quote from him. He kind of gives a synopsis of what we talked about last week just a little bit there about the sealing of the Spirit in our inheritance. And then we're going to get into the actual earnest of our inheritance uh, tonight. But he says this, hence it is applied to persons as denoting that they are approved. Like the Bible, as the Bible talks about, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So he's picturing what he's talking about is the sealing of the Spirit and uh, how the sealing is a protection. Uh, is what, that's what God does. He protects his own. And where it is said of the Savior, for him that hath God the Father sealed in John 3, 33. In a similar manner, Christians are said to be sealed, to be sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. That is, the Holy Spirit is given to them to confirm them as belonging to God. He grants them His Spirit. The, the Spirit of God is a gift to those who have trusted Christ as their Savior, those who have been born again by the Spirit of God. They are regenerated, they are made new in Christ, and they are given the Spirit of God. And he, His presence is the sealing. Okay, that's what that, he is, His presence, God in you, is the sealing. Not the feelings and the affirmations and the things that come as a result of that or any of the, the, the actual attributes of that. But he is our seal. The Holy Ghost is. And uh, we ought to thank God for that. He grants us his spirit. He renews and he sanctifies us. He produces in our hearts those feelings and hopes and desires which are an evidence that they are approved by God. That they are regarded as the adopted children that their hope is genuine and that their redemption and salvation are sure. It would be a terrible thing for God to give you his spirit and you to have no evidences or witness of that spirit. But you must understand that if you look for evidences within you and not through the scriptures as applied to you, you are going to be in trouble because you're going to be searching for signs and wonders and everything else, and you're not going to have the power of the Spirit and the edification that God's Spirit has for you right there in the words of God. The, it's the Word that is applied to the heart through the Holy Ghost to, to cement that into our understanding. It is God's Spirit that does that. These are the evidences. Uh, Alexander McLaren said it this way. He said, the sealing of the Spirit is an earnest of that inheritance, or in other words, a part of that inheritance already vouchsafed to the soul and a pledge that the remainder shall in due time be given to it. It is that down payment. He is, the Holy Ghost, is that down payment for us that we will dwell with God for all of eternity. God says, I will give you my spirit. It's not in man's power to sanctify his own soul. That is the truth nor can anyone assure himself that he is the Lord's. To impart these blessings is the prerogative of God alone. It is God's spirit. That's why when men seek for assurance of their salvation or they seek for that, that, that strength or that assurance, if they try to seek it some other way than God has for them, they will not receive the assurance. And many times they have the assurance, they just misunderstand what it is. 
They're looking for something else and they're not finding it. They're looking for something after the human nature and God is not human. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It is God that directs our hearts through the word of God to supply that, that, that assurance that we need. That, that means that I can't talk you into assurance of your salvation. I can't talk you out of assurance of your salvation. It's not of man to do that. I can try to encourage you and I can try to help you, but you gotta get alone with God, you gotta believe God, and you gotta get in the scriptures, and you gotta trust God, and you gotta believe his promises, and God's gonna assure your hearts through that, but no other way not going to be assured through anything else that's God's way and when you try to do it another way it's nothing but idolatry because you're seeking something else that will not give you spiritual profit it will not grow you for you to be assured within yourself is not to strengthen you for you to be assured in God's promises will strengthen you you see the difference one is a self-dependence that becomes a gluttony of self and it's morbid and God won't feed into your morbidity. He will not. He'll, he wants you to walk with him and to learn from him. So then you've got to get into his word and you've got to, uh, you've got to allow the Holy Ghost to work in your heart and life. And to apply, that's how he does it. He does it through his words. He doesn't do it through your feelings. You're trying to see and feel something and you're not going to. You don't have to. Isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if you had to feel something in order to be right with God? That's a terrible thing because sometimes your feelings go haywire. And if you're trusting those, you're in trouble. But if you trust in what God says and your assurances come from the book, they come from the Holy Ghost, they come straight from the words of God and feasting in your soul on those words, then you will be strengthened. You will have the strength that is long-lasting strength, not junk food, but spiritual truth deep into the soul of a man. That's what God does. That's, it. That's the work of the Spirit. Now, next, number two, the sealing of the Holy Ghost is our down payment, which is the earnest of our inheritance, is the earnest, until the redemption of the purchased possession. It's just like when you put earnest money down, it's similar to that. As you put earnest money down on a home, you don't have that home right away. And though, you know, you have to wait, right? Until the purchase possession, the redemption of the purchase possession under the praise of his glory. So that's a promise. That earnest is a promise that you are going to sign that mortgage or you're going to fulfill your promise to buy that home. It's, it, there's earnest money that is put down. That is a pledge. It's something which stands for part of the price, said Webster, and paid beforehand to confirm the transaction. So the Holy Ghost gives you his, God gives you the Holy Ghost to confirm the transaction of salvation that was upon your soul. Because that's an eternal transaction that takes place in time. That's what it is. It's eternity. He gives you eternity and he regenerates you with his spirit, but he gives you his spirit. That's the, his spirit is the earnest. It is the first fruits of that which is in advance. It is the promise of something to come. Early fruit may be an earnest fruit to follow. So it's, it's, it's something that God gives us his spirit and he gives it to us to assure our hearts. And I think sometimes people are looking for assurance in the wrong places and the wrong ways and they become very confused. You can become very tangled up and confused. Because you'll confuse your, your, your lack of feelings or your over feelings or your emotions for, a, 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 for assurance or a lack thereof. That is not where you're to look for that. Just because you were wonder, if you were, if the day you got saved, you were completely wonderfully happy and jumping up and down and, and jumping for joy and that, that joy lasts for a while. And then all of a sudden after you're saved for a while, about a year or so, then, or maybe it's a month, maybe it doesn't, it's different for everyone. It doesn't matter. There's no time frame. God didn't put that on there. But it doesn't matter. You're gonna, and then all of a sudden you're going to go through something and, and some things are going to change. And it's going to be like, whoa, this is the Christian life that I'm living. This is, this is, this is hard. This is not easy, and I, I don't have all the, the joy and hope and, and laughter and all those things that I, I had the day I got saved. That's because you got clean. 
And when you get clean for the first time like that, it's, it's marvelous, isn't it? It's wonderful. It does something to your soul. And, and, to, and to everything about you, there's a joy in you. But that joy didn't save you. That wonderful feeling that you have wasn't your salvation. Jesus Christ is your salvation. Amen. If you tie that to your comfortable feelings and thoughts, you will be, you will be in trouble because those are going to change with life and time and circumstances and hardships and trials and tribulations and everything else that comes your way. And you've tied everything to your emotions. By the way, that's not that uncommon. Most Christians do it, but God will spank you out of trusting your emotions. He'll whip you out of doing that. And it may take a long time. It may take a week. It may take a month. It may take a year. It may take 30 years. But you will be whipped out of that. God will whip you out of that and teach you. You will not trust that. You will trust me. Amen. He'll wean you from that. He'll wean you from that, that trust of your own self and emotions that you, that you develop over time. Because you connect the two together. Our text tells us that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance by which we understand that he is not only the pledge for a pledge is given for security, but when the thing pledged is given, then the pledge itself is restored. But he is an earnest, which is the pledge and something more. And earnest is a part of the thing itself. It is not only a pledge of the thing for security, but it is a foretaste of it for present enjoyments. Spurgeon preached an excellent sermon on this verse, and he talked about that. And one of the things he talked about is, is the evidences of that, of that sealing of that spirit, that earnest of our down payment. And he talked about the scriptures and understanding them and God teaching you things that no man ever taught you. And that God bringing things to your understanding that no man could bring to your understanding and teach you. And, and how he gave you uh, desires to, to cry out to him, to read his Bible, to pray, to learn, to grow. Those are all the things of the present. Those are all the fruit of the presence of the Spirit of God. You're in church tonight for what? You're not here for me just to yell at you, are you? That isn't very joyful when it's just that. If you're just getting preached to, if you weren't saved by the grace of God and your hearts didn't desire to know the truth and to have it preached to you and have your heart stirred up by it. It's not of you. You think it's of your flesh. Your flesh hates this. Your flesh doesn't love this. My flesh doesn't love this. It's the Spirit of God that loves it. It's the Spirit of God in you that craves it, that desires it, that knows that it's your need, that you must have it. That's God's Spirit. That's the earnest. That's why he gave you his Spirit. That's, that's why he gave it to you. you. Say, well, I don't always feel like doing that. Duh. Of course you don't. You're in this flesh. You feel like going your own way, doing your own thing, giving over to yourself, going home and going to sleep instead of coming here and listening to somebody preach until nine o'clock and you get to bed late. You got to get up early in the morning, right? Hey, that's just the truth, ain't it? Come on. I, I, I'm not offended by that. That doesn't bother me any. I get it. I understand it. I'm just being a realist with you. I get it. It's the, it's the love of Christ that brings you, right? That's the love of Christ that causes us to get along when we don't always agree about everything. But we still have to love each other. We don't get to stop loving each other because we're not in agreement about every little jot and tittle of things. I'm not talking about the word of God being the truth. I'm talking about you and I and what we believe in different things and things that are not gospel issues, right? Things that are not damnable heresies or anything like that. That's what causes us to love one another through things. Amen. That's important, isn't it? We're not done with each other just because we don't agree with something. But he is more, the Holy Ghost is. He is a foretaste. Virgin wrote this. He is a sweet antipist of heaven so that they who possess the Spirit of God possess the first taste of heaven. 
They have reaped the first fruits of the eternal harvest. The first drops of a shower of glory have fallen upon them. They have beheld the first beams of the rising sun of eternal bliss. They have not merely a pledge of, for security. They have an earnest, which is security and foretaste combined. So he goes on in his sermon. I'm not going to talk about that any longer, but he goes on in his sermon and he talks about those four, that the Holy Ghost is the foretaste of heaven for us. Like he's the part that makes heaven understandable to us, right? He, he talks about that, how uh, eye hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things that God hath prepared for them that love him, right? And then he says, but the spirit, it's the spirit of God that teaches us that. We can't understand it. You couldn't understand this book without God's spirit. Why do you think there's so many people that don't get it? You think it's because you're just really smart? Or I'm really smart? No, it's because God's spirit is in you. And he teaches you the word of God. And he's driving the truth home to you. And we have really thick heads and we have to have it driven really hard in there sometimes. We are really stubborn, aren't we? We are very stubborn at times. But that, the Holy Ghost is a foretaste of heaven. That's, that's the only way you can relate to heaven is God's spirit applying it from God's word to your heart. Well, why? Because you've never seen it. We, we can't understand it fully. We just believe it. We believe God. And we don't do it because we're really awesome believers. It isn't that. It really isn't. And I'm, I mean, some of you have some unbelief, but I got all the belief. No, it isn't because of that. It's because God gave you his spirit. Right? That's why people can't relate to it. When they're lost, they just look at you like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you getting so excited about? They, don't, they, they can't. They don't have God's spirit. They can't do it. The first success in arms may be an earnest for future success, says one. The Christian's peace of mind in this life is an earnest of the future peace and happiness he shall have one day. When all the toils of life and we go through things, you and I ought to go home at night and we ought to think about heaven before we go to bed. Couldn't we? Don't think about hell. You've seen, you've seen pictures of that all week, all day. Think about heaven. Think about where you're headed. Meditate on heaven. Meditate on what heaven is going to be like. Ask God's spirit to drive it home to you and to, and to teach you and that you could learn from it. It's so funny. A lot of, uh, I, I heard some preachers say uh, many years ago, they said the, the younger a man is, the more he preaches on hell. The older the man is, the more he preaches on heaven. As, they get, as a man of God gets older, they preach more on heaven and they talk about heaven more because that's where they're headed. They so freshly came from hell when they got saved by the grace of God and called to preach, right? So they're preaching about hell and, and they're preaching about what God saved them from and everything else. But then they start to mature and as they get older and they're ready to go home, what are they preaching on? Heaven, because God's preparing them to go home. You, you as older believers, some older believers in Christ, I know you, you've thought about heaven more. You think about it every day more because you're heading there. There's, there's going to come a time when you're not going to be here. For all of us, you're going to be home. It would be nice to take the word of God before you leave and kind of mine out those truths about heaven and remember that there's people there. Right? So the Holy Ghost gives you that foretaste. Your saved ones that went on before you that you love, they're in heaven. You miss them, but they don't miss you. They're not without anything. They have Jesus. They're not without anything. <laughs> they, got, they got Jesus right there with them. They're not without a thing. They're not, but when they turn around and you tap them on the shoulder and you get to heaven, it'll be like you never left them. Because it won't be like this all this time passed. It won't be like that. That's, not, that's how it'll be. So you and I that have those, because for them, it's like a day. Is, they're in heaven. <laughs> it's not like it is for us. Right? We toil on this earth. But the Holy Ghost, he's that foretaste of heaven, isn't he? 
He's the earnest of our inheritance. It is not feelings that we look for. It is the presence of the Holy Ghost that is to be our assurance that we are accepted in the beloved and waiting and awaiting our inheritance one day. This sense of the word is, is, is primary. It's denoting that which goes before in advance, that earnest. That's what that means. Thus, the earnest of the Spirit is given to saints as a pledge or assurance of their future enjoyments of God's presence and favor. He gave you the Holy Ghost. By the way, that doesn't mean you're always going to feel good about everything just because the Holy Ghost is in you. No, when you're as sinful as we are, you're going to feel really bad sometimes. You're going to be really convicted sometimes, and you and I are going to have to get right with God sometimes. Amen. When we've been thinking about ourselves too much, and we've been, when we've been selfish or not kind to people or any of those other things, right? That's what we have to do. We'll be convicted over that. God's presence isn't always a, in the sense of a, a pleasant thing for you and I. It is a wonderful thing overall. Thank God for it. But it isn't always uh, well-pleasing uh, to our minds and hearts. God is a refiner and his spirit is a refiner. And he burns out the impurities of the saints. That's what his purpose is to do. Part of his purpose in you is to burn out that, th those, those impurities that are in you. And you and I have plenty of them. The first one and foremost being that we think too highly of ourselves. Amen. Remember, Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. This is how his spirit comes in and performs his ministry in our lives. And that ministry that he performs in our lives and his seal in us assures us that we have that future in heaven with Christ for all of eternity. His sealing is the down payment of divine transaction. In each place, in the same connection as applied to the Holy Spirit and his influences on the heart, it always refers to those influences as a pledge of the future glories which awaits Christians in heaven. In regard to the earnest or the part of a price which was paid, that it was of the same nature as the full price being regarded as a part of it. It's the same nature. That's what, it's the same nature. That's what he's giving you. He's giving you a foretaste of heaven by giving you the Holy Ghost. And he's saying, you have much more to look forward to when you drop this flesh one day, you rise. It was regarded as a pledge or assurance that the full price would be paid. So the earnest of the Spirit denotes that God gives to His people the influences of His Spirit. Thank God. His operation on the heart as a part or pledge that all the blessings of the covenant of redemption shall be given to them. The Redeemer's love. Christ's payment for our sins. Redemption. So the Holy Ghost, the spirit of promise comes and he seals us to that day of redemption when God cashes everything in. All his people are made new. See, we wait for that, that day of redemption. We wait for that. We long for that, don't we? To be perfect. Yeah. Not to sin anymore. Not to do sinful things, not to think sinful thoughts, not to react sinfully to situations that we get ourselves in. One day, one day, when God calls us home, we'll be all done with that. <laughs> Amen. We'll never fail God again. The great, one of the greatest things about salvation is God will be glorified in us. We'll, with trophies of His grace. Amen. To go to heaven, be thrown at His feet. Amen. The Holy Ghost ministry says this, See, I have made you like Christ. I've given you, his, I've given you my spirit, and I've made you like Christ. The down payment of my promise. The earnest is part of the payment. It secures the full sum. So is the gift of the Holy Ghost. Again, 
to remind us all his influences, his operations, both as a sanctifier and a comforter, are heaven begun. Glory in the seed and the bud. Not fully mature on this side, but begun. Will be fully matured in heaven. Amen? But it's God's promise. It's God's promise. The Spirit's illumination is an earnest of the everlasting light. Sanctification is an earnest of everlasting joys. Sanctification is an earnest of, of perfect holiness that you and I will one day have. Now, God sees us as perfectly holy in Christ, correct? That's how God sees us, because the blood is upon us and our sins are forgiven. But one day, in practice, you and I will be perfect. Perfect holiness. His comforts are earnest of everlasting joys. You do not have everlasting joy here. Things interrupt your joy here. Things interrupt your happiness here. They will interrupt your happiness here because you are flesh and blood. You and I, we have this flesh and, and we have life's trials to go through and it will interrupt our joys. There will be times of sorrow that are deeply sorrowful times in our lives. Maybe years that they last years. And then there'll be times of joy that seem to go on for a, for a very long time. Well, those are foretastes of heaven. Those are blessings from the Spirit of God to remind us that one day we will have eternal bliss. One day God will wipe all tears from their eyes. All sorrows will be over. Right? It'll be over. He is said to be the earnest until the redemption of the purchased possession. This earnest makes it as sure to the heirs as though they were already possessed of it and it is purchased for them by the blood of Christ. Redemption of it is mentioned because it was mortgaged and forfeited by sin, and Christ restores it to us, and so is said to redeem it in an allusion to the law of redemption. Observe from all this, says one, what a gracious promise that it, that it is which secures the gift of the Holy Ghost to those who ask Him. Those that come to Christ he says, I will in no wise cast out. And he gives his spirit. He gives the illumination of that spirit. The earnest. The redemption. That comes with that. The Holy Spirit is a gift. So the gift of God certifies the right to the heavenly inheritance. As well as gives a meekness for it. He is the first fruits of eternal glory and happiness and of the same kind with it. And as he is enjoyed in measure by the saints now is lesser than the communion which they shall have with him and with the father and the son hereafter for the best things are reserved till last. That communion that we have, that fellowship that we have and that communion with the Holy Ghost that we have now is but a picture. It's a small, it's an earnest, it's a down payment of the eternal joy that awaits us. The saint finds trouble when he believes that he should have eternal rest here. Not here. This is war. This is war. We have moments of rest, right? We have moments of bliss. We have moments of joy. But life is full of a mixture of sorrows and joy. You will have, it will not be the way, it will not be heaven yet. But we do have those foretastes, don't we? Of what it will be like to commune with God face to face forever. Which they shall have with him and with the Father and the Son hereafter for the best things are reserved till last and being once given into the heart as an earnest he always continues but never removes more or is ever taken away God's Spirit is forever with us until we go home it takes us all the way there death does not interfere with the Spirit of God 
by his spirit, he lays us down in the grave. Before we hit the grave, when our soul is gone, when we die and our breath is over, when the breath of life is out of us, his spirit takes us home. Hallelujah. What a savior. God never leaves his children alone. I don't buy this whole dark tunnel stuff and all this other stuff that people talk about. You know what I believe? I believe what God says, for so an entrance shall be administered unto you. God says there's an entrance that's administered unto us from here to home. You, you have an escort. Amen. God doesn't leave you alone. He doesn't, he doesn't leave. He will never leave you alone. He will take you. Right? Is to be present with the Lord. That's God's promise. That's the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the earnest of our inheritance. Three, until the redemption of the purchased possession. We see the same language in Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. I've heard some really goofy interpretations of this verse from people. I say, well, if you grieve him, he's... He's going to leave you. That's why you're not supposed to grieve him. No, that's not. The, that's dumb. That's not, even, that's not even anywhere near what the text says. It says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. He's with you. Don't grieve him. He's in you. Don't grieve him. If you grieve the Holy Ghost by sin and by wickedness in your life as a child of God, yeah, God will withhold his comfortable presence from you in that sense, the joys of your salvation. You've had that happen, haven't you? By sin and by not living right, by rebellion to God, by disorder, by other things like that. And you lose by not walking orderly and not walking uh, biblically like you should, or your heart being hardened and, and uh, you know, sinful thoughts that you entertain and continue to go along with and don't, don't repent of. And then what happens to you when you do that? Then you, your joy is taken and you're, you, you, you don't have that comfortable peace that you desire from God because you've grieved the Holy Spirit of God. There are things worse than dying for a Christian. Grieving the Holy Ghost and God dealing with you over that for a while is very difficult to take. I know because I've experienced it. I not only read it in the scriptures, but I've, I've lived it. I've experienced it. I know what that's like. For God to deal with you, for God to be grieving in your soul. We can grieve God's spirit. He is, he is God in us, given to us. That is God's spirit given to you. You ought to think twice about that, at least. That it should matter to you if you grieve God's spirit by entertaining impure thoughts, by, by a bad attitude, by walking in sin and rebellion, by not being kind to others, by bitterness in your heart, by, by the works of the flesh, and a continual that when God tells you, don't do that, don't you do that, and God warns you and you do it anyway. Right? You can grieve God's spirit. And that may take a while. That doesn't mean God doesn't forgive you right away. There's consequences. There's the chastening of the Lord. I mean, when your children sin against you, you forgive them. Right? That doesn't mean there's no consequences for their actions. There are always consequences for us as a Christian if we sin. And that, is a, that, is a number one, that is one of the ways. By the way, you know another way to grieve the Holy Ghost of God is unbelief. Just simply not believing God. Amen. Just having unbelief in your heart and not believing God. Refusing to be comforted by the Lord will grieve the comforter. When God has that comfort by faith for you and you refuse to be comforted, you will grieve the Spirit of God by simply not believing God. How, by the way, you could see an example of that in the Gospels. What did Jesus groan in his spirit over? 
their unbelief. Yeah, their hardness of heart, it made him weep. They thought he was weeping because Lazarus was dead and that, that he, nobody's dead to Jesus. All he has to do is speak and they're alive. Amen. Amen. That ought to tell you all your lost family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, whoever it is. Nobody is beyond the Holy Ghost's reach. Nobody is beyond God saving. Jesus Christ raises the dead and he still does it. You better remember that. Don't you give up on anybody. I don't care if it's a butcher that's committing abortions or a doctor or a, or a Catholic priest or anybody. God's spirit is able to work in that heart. God is able to save their souls. You better remember that. Don't, live it, don't operate in unbelief and not believe that God can't save the hardest of hearts. He saved you, didn't he? Amen. You better pray for those people and you better believe God that he'll save them. That God is well able to do it. Ephesians 4.30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Don't grieve him by your unbelief. You see something, let me show you an example of that. You want to know how you grieve God? Here. You see in the word what God says, that him that cometh to me and I will in no wise cast out. And the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Right? Tells you what salvation is, tells you what it means to be saved. You see that in the scriptures, you've trusted Christ as your Savior, and then you doubt him. And you, act, you doubt him to his face, and you continue to doubt what God says. You continue to doubt his word, you don't believe him because of your feelings or your emotions or your fears or your doubts, and you don't believe God. Well, and you're, you're wondering, why, why am I lacking this? Why do, well, you're not believing God. The Holy Ghost is in you and you're denying his presence. And I'll tell you what, I had some, I had some times when I went through that depression, man, and I, I said some pretty crazy things and I'm glad only God heard, because God's the only one that can handle them, amen? But I'll tell you what, I, I said some things, and man, I, I'll tell you what, I knew the Lord told me, he said, don't, don't say that. Don't you say that. Man. God said, don't you say that. Don't you entertain that. Amen. Come on, I mean it. Did you hear an audible voice? No, I didn't have to. I was scared anyway. I didn't, God, God didn't have to give me no audible voice. He just... He just made it very apparent that I was speaking against, I was speaking against what God's word said, and you better stop doing that. You better not believe something that God didn't say like that. Don't you entertain that. Don't you grieve the Holy Spirit of God by doing that. He's a comforter. You want comfort, that's where you're getting it. You ain't getting it nowhere else. Not lasting comfort anyway. The day you receive your inheritance is the day of redemption of the purchased possession. That's what Paul says, sealed unto the day of redemption. That's the day, yeah, when you are glorified in Christ. Praise the Lord. No more to sin. Number one, the best part about it is to see Jesus. Number two, I don't have to, I won't sin anymore. Right? I won't sin anymore. That's going to be a blessing, isn't it? I look forward to that. He gives us the Holy Ghost as our, until we go on to our eternal reward. The influence of the Holy Spirit now is what we are given until the purchase of the redemption, right? The purchase possession. That's the renewing and sanctifying of us, the comforting of us in our trials, and the sustaining us in, in afflictions. It is the pledge that the redemption is yet to be Wholly ours, completely ours. That's why he gives you the Holy Ghost. Not so you sit around and wonder about whether you're saved or not, or wonder, uh, wonder if it took, like some people say. You don't have to do that. Holy Spirit bears witness with this book right here. Amen. These are the saints of God that are bought with a price. They're purchased with his blood. And who as they were redeemed from sin, Satan, and the law, when they were purchased, so will be redeemed again in the resurrection morning, which is called the day of redemption, right? That day that Christ redeems all things. 
He bought us, he purchased us, and he's going to claim us, amen, one day. Which will be a redemption of them from the weakness, corruption, and mortality of the body. From their present, by the way, if everything was so peachy here for you, you'd never want to go to heaven. Do you get that? Do you get that? If God indulged every one of our foolish lusts and our desires and our gluttony of, 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 of good feelings and everything else, you wouldn't want to ever leave. If God made this heaven for you, you'd have nothing to look forward to. And you wouldn't want to leave. So what does God do? He reminds you through afflictions, this is not heaven. This, this is not your home. You are strangers and pilgrims and don't you forget it. Don't you get comfortable there. Amen. Right. Don't get comfortable here. Oh, no, I should always feel good. And really? Well, then you wouldn't have anything to look forward to to heaven. Why would you want to go? I'm telling you, we are so absolutely idolatrous and we are so fleshly that we would not want to go to heaven. If God kept you 25 years old where you didn't have a backache and you didn't have any neck aches, you didn't have any problems, and you, you know, you had your youth, you, all that stuff, you, and he just kept you that age, what is that called? It's called heaven! You're going to be you're going to be vibrant and perfect there. That's heaven. You're asking for it here. Right? Yeah, no bills, everything perfect, my mansion. Well then, what well, sir, what you're describing is heaven and you have to wait for that. Right? You're describing it where all my bills are paid and everything's perfect. I don't, and I don't know the mortgage man. <laughs> I don't know my house. The mortgage man owns my house. I don't know. I, I just live there. I'm just kind of renting, like, and I have to pay the taxes. I don't. I think I'm getting taken advantage of. But anyway, uh, right? Does anybody feel like they're getting taken advantage of? Wait a minute. I'm just renting this and I'm paying the taxes. What's going on here? How's that working? Wait. Okay. All right. You own it though. Yeah. You. Own, he owns it. Okay. Anyway, but. But, that, but what you're describing where none of that is true is heaven. Right? So if you want no heartache, no pain, no suffering, then thank God for heaven and say, Lord, I'm going to suffer through anything you have for me here, and I'm going to love people. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to be a soldier. I'm going to have my armor on, and I'm not going to sit around and whine about it, but I'm going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and I'm going to continue moving on until you take me home because this is not my home, and I really want to be with you one day, and I'd hate to live here forever. Oh, Wouldn't you hate to live here forever? Like this? Yeah, when you know God frees you, doesn't he? When death is a freedom from it, it's deliverance from it, it is. He's saying, well, I'm gonna drop that flesh to the ground and your soul's going home. You're free. That's redemption, amen. From the reproaches and persecutions of men. Yeah, he did. From a tempting devil, Right? You're going to be freed one day. You're going to be delivered completely in that day of redemption. What? From a tempting devil and an unbelieving heart. Oh, that man, no truer words did that man speak when he spoke to the Lord Jesus and he, and Jesus, uh, and he said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. He was an honest man, wasn't he? Yeah, I believe, Lord, but help thou my unbelief. There's a lot of it in there. I do believe you, though. From an unbelieving heart, from all doubts and fears, and from death and the grave. He told us in 1 Corinthians 15, oh, by the way, you're going to die. Your body's going to go to the earth, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about what happens to that body. Like, I need like a $10,000 funeral. No, I don't. If you can bury me in a box somewhere and throw me down there, don't waste any money. I ain't going to be there anyway. Right? What's the matter anyway? Just make a nice box and seal it up a little bit if you want to, I guess. Don't waste a good suit either. Don't be doing that. 
Don't waste a good suit there. Give that to somebody. Put me in a pair of jogging pants and a t-shirt. I'll be fine. <laughs> right? Don't put me... and, and don't even bury my fat tire shoes either. You can take, give those to somebody else too. Don't be putting anything worth of value down in that, that box. You put me in that stale old box and throw that in the ground and praise God for it and we'll move on and see each other one day, right? Don't put, don't put me in a t-shirt and some, and some, uh, yeah, jogging pants and we'll be done. Just throw me down on the ground there. Oh, he died. Or my Carhartt sweater that has holes in it. You can put me in that too. Just throw me down. What? It's fine, right? It's like, why does people dress up for their funeral? What, what are you doing? What are you going to dress me up, make me look real nice, and you're going to bury me? It's gross. I'm dead. I think you're, you're putting a suit on a dead body. Knock it off. It's weird. Just whatever I died in, just leave me in it. I don't... Well, hopefully, hopefully there'll be something over me, but in case I die like that. But anyway, you know what I mean, right? Why spend the money? Wrap me up like a mummy and throw me down in there. Right, Garrick? What's the matter? I mean, why waste the money? Give the suit to somebody else. Right? Anyway. You're not going to be there. You don't care. I know. Well, everybody else cares. Not really. You don't care. Do you really care if I'm buried in a suit? Even my wife will. And Andrew says, yeah, you should be in a suit. You need to look nice for your death. I'm, I'm already gone. Oh, well, they can remember me in my Carhartt sweater and my... Don't put me in the fat tire sneakers, though. Put me in the cheap ones that I got at the dollar store or something. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be burying me in any good stuff. Give my boots to somebody who needs them. Amen. Anyway, that's what we have to look forward to. Not, not the boots, but... The ceiling and the indwelling of the believer is God's down payment. We're going home. Amen. That's what's happening. The inheritance is, I want to remind you of something as we close here. The inheritance is incorruptible. Nothing can corrupt it. And it's undefiled. Not defiled. Can't be defiled. Amen. That inheritance, you know what? Where, the, where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. Right? That's here. There's so many people that lay up for themselves earthly treasures. They want to amass all the wealth and do everything they can and do all that, and that's what they live for. Well, why? It's all going to burn. I was reading this article, and uh, that famous martial art actor, Jackie Chan, he's worth like $400 million, and he said, what comedy? It just showed this meme on there, and he goes, he goes, I'm not leaving any of my money to my son. Like, whoa. He had like $400 million, and he said, I'm not leaving it to my son. He said, he said, for two reasons. He said, one, if he can't make it himself, if he can't make it himself, he's just going to waste mine anyway. <laughs> That's what he said. And, and two, uh, if he can make it, he doesn't need mine anyway. That's what he said. <laughs> so he said, I'm giving $400 million to charity. <laughs> I give that kid nothing. Oh, the Bible does say to, you know, you should give an inheritance to your children if you have it. Right? Spiritual, of course, first, and then, obviously, whatever else you have left. But uh, anyway, uh, the inheritance is incorruptible and undefiled, and it fadeth not away. Reserved in heaven for you. That doesn't sound like a maybe to me. That sounds like definitely. Like the reservations are already made. Sealed by the Holy Ghost, reserved in heaven for you. That's powerful, isn't it? It's that resurrection body that we're going to receive. Turn to Romans 8.23. We'll do this scripture, then we'll stop here. But, but, uh, and I'll finish this up and add to it for the next verse next week. But uh, Romans 8.23, it's that body that we're promised. Verse number 22 says this, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. 
waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. That's it, isn't it? The redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is not seen, is, hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Amen. But, it, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Amen. So we'll finish this up. We'll, we'll, we'll stop there and we'll finish this up. Uh, this part up next week, we'll talk about the redem redemption, the redemptive body, and, and uh, what God will do with us in our inheritance. All right? And then we'll add to the, the next verse, Lord willing, however far we get there. But uh, praise the Lord. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. That's what God does. That's God's promise. You've got a lot to look forward to. You need to meditate on these promises of God. You need to meditate on these verses and meditate on, on the, the, these things and study them out and see what God has for us. Whom he also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Purchased, already paid for. Unto the praise of his glory, which we'll talk about next week. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your words. Lord, we thank you that we have them. We're not looking for them, Lord. We hold them in our hands, the words of life. Lord, what encouragement they bring our hearts to, to hear them, to hear them preached, to receive them in our hearts to apply them to our lives. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit to all them that believe, that he guides us, he nurtures us and teaches us and fits us for heaven. Thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name.